Our greatest successes in life are often found in helping others succeed. Welcome to the Life Masters Podcast, hosted by Tanya Memi. Discover real life stories from mentors, leaders, experts, and everyday people who devote their lives to helping others succeed. Every episode takes you on a unique journey, an emotional experience, and tells a story never to be forgotten. Tune in to Life Masters with Tanya Memi and start fast tracking your journey to success today. Today in the EverTalk TV studio, we have Jeffrey Saad. Now, I absolutely adore this person because, for so many reasons, but we shot together a few weeks ago. He's become a very, very good friend of mine, and he is so good at basically everything you do <laughs> turns to gold. So you uh, are a kick-butt real estate agent in town. I love in, it. In Hollywood. And uh, you sell some of the most exclusive and most celebrity-owned homes. And also you are, um, okay, get this. He is a <laughs> chef, but not just a chef. He's written a cookbook. You've been on so many competition shows. Yeah. Right? Like some names. Yeah, some Next of them. Food Network star, Chopped All Stars. I know. Under pressure, good stuff. Right. And you actually almost won one of them. You're a runner. Well, you're yeah, runner. I have position two nailed. Always runner up. <laughs> oh, well, I know how that feels. I totally know how that feels. And so a couple of weeks ago, I went over to your house. I had dinner at your house. And I, Honest, I'm still dreaming about the food that you cook. Yay, good. That's right? the goal. You That's the leave goal. People with that memory, they want one more bite. That's when you know it was a good night. You are the thing I love most too is you're so passionate about food. Yeah. You know, I've met plenty of chefs, but you really are passionate about Thank every you. single bite. I mean, I love it. I'm constantly, I call it mind tasting. You know, it's like I'm thinking about food. You know, my wife always gives me a hard time because I'll wake her up with a latte in the morning. I'll be like, all right, for dinner tonight, what do you think if I do a sous vide octopus? She's like, uh, how about we have coffee? Can we can we wake up first? I'm like, okay, how about now? <laughs> yeah, but you had me at when I make my wife coffee in the morning. Yeah. Like this right <laughs> the rest is like icing on the cake. But yeah. no, you really are. You've 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 you're so successful at everything you do. And I just love seeing you, you know, in in you're you're really living the life that you've always wanted to live. And you've you've said that since the day I've met you. Yeah. You know, I always say if I could change one thing about my life, I wouldn't. You wouldn't. You no, know, it's the journey, you yeah. know, it's incredible. Yeah, and I learned that from you too, even more and more. But um, so I want to know because you have one of the most incredible life stories. So over a couple cocktails one night, <laughs> I got it all out of Jeffrey, and I was like, "Man, you got to come on my show. You are just it's, your life story is incredible, and Thank what you've grown to be is just massively. It's just amazing." So, but I want to know, like, so where did all of this? Did you know you wanted to be a chef? Did you? When did all of this start? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I do feel blessed because I think everybody, right, we all are searching for our passion, right? Everyone wants to do their passion. Yeah. And, and I do feel lucky that at 13 years old, I just somehow knew that I wanted to cook. You know, I was a little wimp, couldn't play sports in my junior high school. So I went and, you know, applied to this dishwashing job at a restaurant. You know, after a few months, they gave me a nice little paper hat and I was a cook, you know, and I was in the line griddling, griddling you know, frozen burgers. And I'd put that burger out to the dining room and I'd see these people take a bite and it'd be like, the most joyous moment. I'm like, it's just a burger, but it wasn't just a burger. It was a way for them to escape for a minute. And I said, that is how I want to spend my life vending joy, you know, doing that. And, uh, you know, and, and our, my childhood was weird. So food, I think, was always kind of my peaceful place, too. It was my escape. It was my joy. Now, what was it like? I mean, how did, how did you grow up and where did you grow up? And Grew up in the good old Midwest, which I'm always yeah. grateful for. Somehow, you know, it's like whenever I go to New York, when I first moved out to California, you know, you're like, hey, how you doing? Good morning. And they're like, what do you want? You know? <laughs> yes, exactly. um, I don't uh, Friendship. You know, it's like, you know, if you're nice, they think you want something, right? I was like, no, it's just the Midwest. You know, so yeah, I, I grew totally up in the Midwest and worked for my godfather's Italian restaurant, like right out of a movie, you know, the stuff that went on and went to culinary school, went to hotel restaurant school, ended up in California as just really, I mean, started, went to culinary school in New York, but ended up transferring and finishing in California and got hooked and never left. It's amazing here. But what makes a 13 year old want to, um, please people so much with food, like, and, and want to work. I mean, yeah. That's something, like, how did that happen as a kid? Where did that come from? That's a great question, you know? That's a really good question. I think that's the part, like, I always say, you know, you're born with certain things, and then you can work to achieve certain things, right? So just because you're born here and I'm born here, it doesn't mean I can't pass you up. But we are gifted with being born with certain things, and I've always felt this internal drive to do something bigger and better, like, and it's always been service-related. I love vending joy. I love being of service. And like I said, I think it was that, that uncomfortableness at home that when I went out and got to bring pleasure to people and see their happiness, it just kept fueling itself. And I realized that like that hospitality and then food, of course, it was like, you know, 
we would go to these fancy country clubs and restaurants when I was little. My mm-hmm. parents, and my mom would be off doing her thing, but I would just sit there and lose myself in this shrimp cocktail, you know. First time I bit in and got that sweetness of the sea and it, the shrimp would pop and then that spiciness of the cocktail sauce. I was like, what is what happening is here? You know, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, eating is not optional, so you might as well make it an amazing journey. And then I just started playing. And my mom was, uh, well, I actually joke because I say that I, was, I grew up thinking she was a great cook. And then I realized she just cooked often. <laughs> right. Know, when I moved out to California, I was me. like, yeah, I was like, oh, wait, green beans are green. You know, all of a sudden <laughs> you start opening up this world of real cooking and flavors and you're like, wow. So um, what I know that I know that life wasn't always easy for you. Yeah. But what was your childhood like? You know, um, I was blessed in that, you know, my father is very wealthy and we had great yeah. friends and everything. But as a young boy, you know, um, my mom went to trial for shooting him to death. He was shot in, in our house. And, you know, I, you know, you never know how much you block out and how much you remember. But I do remember the, you know, blood curdling scream of our nanny when she went upstairs from the breakfast table and found so this him. happened in your house. Yeah. Yeah. We're at breakfast. I'll never forget. It's funny. It's like watching one of those movies, you know, where they do the little flashes and it's like, and then your memory goes away and then it comes back. Yeah. It was nuts. It was I mean, nuts. this is just, this is not, I mean, this is a story that so many, we don't get to hear stories like this from, from someone. See, what, what is so amazing about you is, is you look at life with the hat, with the glass half full. But to see what you went through, so I remember you talked to me about this. You're sitting at the breakfast table that yeah. day. And, and Just hear what this. was it like that day? You know, a very distinctive scream, right? It's amazing how much you You had get no idea. Scream. No, I had you didn't no even idea. know your parents were fighting. Well, it was, you know, again, I was young enough that, you know, I don't know what happened. I mean, he was found in the morning, and when the nanny went up there, and, you know, he was in bed, bled to death, dead. And then my mom went on trial for it. She ended up being acquitted, but, you know. So what was going through your mind when your mom is on trial, you have to go to court, and this happened to you? I mean, you're dealing with the death of your father. I think I'm lucky in that, you know, that's the great thing about being younger is, you know, I don't remember all those details. Yeah. It really comes flooding in when you're a young teenager and, you know, I'm feeling the aggression of my mother. You know, that was her reward for ruining all of our lives is then to just be even more horrible and abusive and it was really tough but I again I feel lucky that I always said there's something better out there life doesn't have to be like this like I just knew it that there was something better how did your siblings uh, deal with it you know uh, my little sister has always struggled but I always say she's a warrior wrapped in you know an angel or she's an angel wrapped in a warrior's clothing you know she's always battled she's good to the core but she's always battled and but she always comes out on top which is amazing my older sister is just a giver she's just full of love and you know we're very tight and we always she likes to tell stories my sister's one of those people with uh, memories that every little detail she's like when you were three and a half you were wearing the red shoe and the you know she remembers yeah. everything wow that's and she not, says, not always good in a situation she says like you this. saved me with food that's what she tells me because she would wake me up in the middle of the night you know and i'd we'd go down to the kitchen she'd say make a creation so i'd start whipping stuff up when we were little kids and i'd tell her she told me a story and i totally forgot about it. i'd tell her blind taste blind smell me on the spice rack pull out of spice. I'll shut my eyes and I'll, I'll tell you what it is. You know, so even back then, for some reason, I was just enamored with like, yeah, but this makes sense. all these flavors. Why you love food so much? Because yeah. that was your escape. Your escape I think it was. was creating these little fantasy food worlds for you and your sisters. Yeah. So that you didn't have to think about what yeah. was going on at that time. What was it like? I mean, you know, days and weeks after that happened for you? You know, again, just really the younger years, fortunately, don't remember or oh, blocked yeah, it yeah. out. You, just, you know, who you knows? Yeah. You know? It really, but you know, as I became a young teenager, my mom was very abusive and very hateful. And I just, I felt all that. You know, I always say you, you have two options usually, right? Either you emulate everything you experienced mm-hmm. when you're young or you want to do the opposite. And I feel blessed that I was determined to do the opposite. I'm like, I'm going to have, I made a list for a wife that you could never find. I found her. You know, I said, I'm going to give and do for my family what, you know, I never had. And it just became a mission for me. It was like, this is what I'm doing. I mean, I just, I, I love that. And then, so what, what's your relationship with your mom now? She passed away, actually. Funny enough, she, what was interesting is I, after many attempts, almost 20 years ago, 15 years ago, to try to get her to talk to us, I'm like, listen. How old were you at the time? Okay, I'm 52 now. I was about, well, it was right when I was dating Nadi. We've been married for 25 years, so it was, I was about 24 or something. And you just felt this need to reach out and connect well, you know, and... I had already started working on myself, and I'm like, you know, I want to hear her side. 
I don't want to just judge mm-hmm. her till death. Let me hear your side. Tell me what I might not understand. Tell me what I don't know. Wrote her a letter, called her. Her response, oh, um, you know, I just bought a new coat. I don't have, can't really afford to fly anywhere and meet. You know, we, you know, just ignored it, ignored it, ignored it. I finally wrote her a letter. And so I she said, didn't go to jail? No, she got acquitted. Yeah, yeah, she got off. And I'm sure it was, a lot of it was because of, you know, us kids, three little kids, poor mom, you know, and all it takes is one little detail. But, wow. but I wrote her a letter, letter just disown her. And the funny part is my sister said, can we sign it? So we all kind of disowned her. And it sounds terrible. And people think, oh, my gosh, you can't, you know, disown a parent. But you know what? No, but Anybody yeah. who doesn't bring joy to your life and who brings that kind of misery, forget it. It wasn't worth it. So she passed away about uh, four months ago or so. And, and it was a real test. I mean, she wasn't that old. She was like 80. Oh, she was 80. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. And so what happened? So it was a real test, you said. Well, because, you know, I had said to my wife a couple of years ago, I said, I got to think through this. I want to talk about this out loud mm-hmm. because one of these days I'm going to get the call. My mom's going to have died. Will I carry any baggage or regret or anything? Is there something different I need to do while she's still alive? And I talked through it and I'm like, no, I'm good. You know, I've made choices that make sense for my family and my life. And when she passed, it was, of course, there was a moment of sadness because I was trying to find the good. You know, I'm grateful. She, her cooking got me inspired to cook, you know. She did insist that I be a gentleman. You know, I still open doors and treat, you know. No, you are. You're a very, you're, you definitely are a gentleman. Yes, yeah, I've absolutely. experienced it. <laughs> well, thank Uber you. riding from you from the, <laughs> when we shot together from our the hotel that we were yeah. happened to be in yeah. and to the studio every day. But So you find the good um, and yeah. you move on. But I was peaceful. So what would you say to, you know, young teens out there or people in their 20s or whatever age they're at where their parents have done this un, I mean, what she did was unforgivable. Sure. And she was acquitted. And how do you wrap your head around that? But you have. And how, like, what is your, your view on forgiveness? And was it forgiveness? Or where does that come from? And what would you say to people out That's there? That's a good question. Was it forgiveness? You know, I th- for me, I think the main message is your biography is not your destiny. You know, stuff will happen. Stuff happens to everybody. Nobody has it easy. We're all human beings. We all have something. But what we also have is a choice. You either say... Now I'm going to make my life great or I'm going to keep telling this story about why I should be a victim and why, you know, no matter what happens to you, stop telling the story because life is a story anyway, right? The only thing that's real is this very moment we're in, right? Mm -hmm. Everything else is a story, a story about the past, a story about what might happen in the future. So I always just decided to tell myself a good story. My life's going to be great. I have every choice right now. Nobody is stopping me from going off to culinary school, to opening my first restaurant, to finding the woman of my dreams. I can do all that if I choose to do it, you know, if I believe that story. So I would say the real thing you have to do is just look it in the face, acknowledge it. Yeah, this happened. This was horrible. It made me feel this way. But now, what are you going to do now? Because basically the three of you, you and your sisters, you guys were on your own for a while too, after all that, weren't you? Well, we were with my mom, but she ended up marrying the guy that probably was her accomplice. And he was horrible. Right. And, you know, I'll let my sisters tell their story one day, but he was a horrible man. How do you live in the same house with, like, how did you deal with that? It was crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, actually. You know, a lot of anger. Oh, yeah. When I got to college, oh, my God. I was determined to kill myself. I mean, I crashed six motorcycles, did every drug. I mean, it was like I purged it all through college. And then I woke up one day and said, okay, enough. So you did do it all in you know, college. You did. Yeah, I have think this. That's, that's where I, I mean. really like let it all just... go. Yeah, I think I used food and service and restaurants. I mean, I worked like crazy even as a young kid. I think work was my escape when I was young. College was my purging, and then all of a sudden I woke up and I said, you know, wait a second. I've been doing martial arts my whole life. I had to practice really hard to be good at that. Snowboarding, scuba diving, whatever I've done, I had to practice to be good at it. So I'm like, why shouldn't? happiness and joy be something you practice as well. So 25 years ago, I started a routine of just having my morning routine, building on what makes me happy and peaceful. Yeah. And it, it is something you got to focus on. You can't just go, oh, I'm going to automatically be happy and, you know, like no. anything. It takes work. So what was that first thing for you after going through all of that in college and, you know, you've done this and that and crashed a bunch of motorcycles and you really purged, like you said, it's a good way of putting it. What was that first first thing that you committed to that really put you on that path to not wanting to do that anymore? That's a great question too. You know, I call it these launch pad moments in your life. Yeah. You know, I was in college and the the chef got arrested for his third DUI and the owner was panicking because he didn't know anything about the kitchen, like most restaurant owners, which this is why happened. I, this is what yeah, happened. Yeah, this is real. This is, yeah. Oh, the in, chef, in not you. The chef in college. The was... chef, yeah. The, well, the chef that was at a restaurant I was working at. Yeah. He got his third DUI. 
the owner came in and said to me, you're the only one that I think knows something about food. Like, will you take his place? So here's this huge restaurant that does crazy volume. I'm 19 in college, my second year. This is right as I was kind of finishing my purging. And he said, please run the kitchen. I said, okay. you got it. <laughs> I went to my teachers. I said, um, you believe in real learning? I'm going to be missing classes a little bit. I'll turn in a report. Let me do this. And something clicked. And oh, my God, I failed miserably. I, I made such a mess, but I learned so much so much. So that was one of those turning moments. And I said, all right, I'm doing this. But I love that my own restaurant. you felt like you failed, even though it wasn't a failure. But after going through all that, after the purging, you know, one more hit can really tailspin you the opposite direction. No, you're, you're right. And I feel bad for people because I think that, that we all have these, these, you know, launch pad moments and it, you can just turn left or turn right. I tell my kids, every little decision you make can change your life forever, good or bad, you know. So I, I felt lucky that I had enough oomph to say I want a better life and I would take the better choice, you know, and, uh, yeah, you know, I'm a big believer in, and I talk about this too, in some of my, um, posts and stuff on social media, the power of one, right? All it takes is that one moment, that one person, that one phone call, that one email. Tell me about sometimes, obviously that was that one moment when, <laughs> oh my goodness. Cue music. <laughs> the one. That's the soundtrack for the one moment. What is happening? <laughs> Okay. Anyways, so with my social media, I, I <laughs> that like never happens. That was funny. So, you know. I thought it was perfectly timed. We're about to make the turn now into mm -hmm. the. Okay. So I mean that has me um, thinking about. So in my social media posts and stuff, I talk about the power of one, like right. that one call, that one person, that one email, that one phone call, and it seems like you've had a few of those moments in your life. So we many. all do thank God, right? Yep. And you never know when they're going to happen. And they usually come out of nowhere in a very unexpected way. So that was a moment for you where the chef is not available for whatever reason. You have to step up because your boss gave you that opportunity. What other moments in your life have you had that one thing happen that has completely turned you onto the most amazing road? So many. And, you know, it, it, and everyone wants to say luck. And, yeah, we... I'd call it maybe timing more than luck. Yeah. But it's really true. If you're always working on yourself and you're always putting yourself out there, all these moments I had were because I was focusing on being better, doing better, right? I was at this restaurant in the kitchen trying to learn during my shift when the restaurant was slow. You weren't so, on the couch thinking, okay, yeah, I wasn't out back today smoking. And, I wasn't right. like, you know, messing around. I was like right. back with the cook trying to learn the food. Well, there we go. So that opportunity presented itself, you know? And then when I was in uh, culinary school, I worked day and night at this restaurant called Rosa Marino in San Francisco. The owner is still like a second father to me. Great guy. And I wrote him this long report of what was wrong at his restaurant. And I'm sure I was horribly uh, inarticulate at the time, but he appreciated the sincerity of it. He said, one day you want to open a restaurant, you call me. So I'm in London doing my cooking apprenticeship. And I realized all of a sudden, this is too fancy. I want to bring people daily joy. I want it to be less expensive, simple. Got on the plane, wrote my business plan for my first restaurant called Sweet Heat in San Francisco. I was 24 years old. And I said, that guy said to call him. So I called him. He said, how much you want? Let's do this. You know, so there was my first restaurant. There was another launch pad moment. Once I was committed to that first restaurant, it was like there was nothing stopping me. I had to make that a success. That's when I went met my wife walking down the street. Everything just started happening. Another launch pad moment. One of my so let's talk about that one because I love this one. You've told me this one before too, and I love this oh. moment. I mean, you know. And you're so in your zone about cooking and this yeah. new restaurant. And you haven't even opened the restaurant yeah, yet, Yeah, I'm right? opening the restaurant. I'm on my way to work at the other restaurant. You know, in my Lots daily grind, on. all of a sudden, stop dead in my tracks. If you see my wife with these big green eyes <laughs> against this gorgeous Persian complexion, it's like she the sun. Stunning. It makes the sun intimidated her eyes. <laughs> and I just said, hello. And she was like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm Jeffrey. Nice to meet you. You know, we just started talking. And she was standing out front having a smoke, by the way. Grew up in Italy, so she's very much that European woman, as you've met, you know. Mm -hmm. She's and, incredible. Uh, I walked into the restaurant I was working at while I was building my restaurant. I said to the staff, I just met my wife. And they're like, I mean, because I was you a typical 24-year-old doing, you know, what 24-year-olds do. And wife was never the word of the day. And they're like, oh, my God. And it was. I knew it. I knew it. So that was another one of those U-turn moments. Yeah. And you guys are still together. Yep. And I love that. Better every year. Amazing. So she's, great. She's power. So what would you say, what, what, do you, what do you think is the key to a great marriage? I really think the key is make a list of everything you're grateful for and that's awesome about them. 
I think a lot of people tend to make the, you're not doing this list or I'm not getting this list. And when you start putting that out there, again, it's like a snowball. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you make a list of the bad, you'll get more bad. You know, mm-hmm. if you make a list of the good, the good gets even better. Mm-hmm. And then they want to do more good and you want to do more good. And it's a competition now of who can love and be better to the other one. Oh yeah, by the way, whatever. I don't do X or she doesn't do X. We figure it out. You know, I think that's a, a big part of it. And just the concept, right, of like with people I say, were you scared getting married because we were one of the youngest in our group to get married? I said, no, I was scared to death of getting engaged because to me that was the moment that, another launch pad moment, I'm doing this for the rest of my life. This isn't like, ah, I've done work out, we won't do it. No, I thought of it as, am I gonna die in bed one day gray and old with this woman? Yes, you know, and it's that level of commitment that made it like, you make it work no matter what. You know, like anything in life, I always say, you will not have greatness in your life until you're sick to your stomach. Because it's those moments where you're afraid. You know, you've done so many things as well. You've been so brave. You've pounded through everything and made great things happen. I know your story too. I have, but I have, I don't feel like I've, I mean, what you experienced was to me just, I mean, there's always someone who's gone through more and I do feel like you've gone through a lot more. So it's, you know, I think everyone has baggage. I was joking to say, we all have baggage. It's just whether you choose to put wheels on it. You can roll it through life and glide along. You can drag that, you know, and your life's tough. So what would you say to, because, you know, th- this is why I started Life Masters was to really help people out there that are struggling, that are yeah. spiraling down, that yeah. are where you were at weeks, days, months, years after that night, that, that yeah. day that happened with yeah. your mom and your dad. What would you say to somebody who is there? What do they do? What's the first step they take? First thing you do is I love that saying that you are the average of the seven or 10 people you spend the most time with. So I would stop and say, who are you spending the most time with? And are they energizing you or exhausting you? And there's a big difference. You know, are you, I always like to be the dumbest guy in the room, the least successful guy in the room because I want to be better. So who are you surrounding yourself with, you know? And the next thing I'd say is pick up a book. I mean, there is nothing, what you put in your head, you know, your thoughts control your emotions, your emotions control your actions, your actions control your life, your Mm -hmm. destiny. So it starts with how you're thinking and what that does to your emotions, which is why I have my morning routine. If you read something positive, inspirational, I mean, I think the art of happiness by the Dalai Lama, as cheesy as it sounds, I think it saved my life because I was 23, just emerging out of my, you know, purging stuff, heading into the restaurant world. And I read that book and I was like, wow, you know, we are all the same. We're all just trying to be happy. We're all just trying to not be hurt, to get by, to live a peaceful life, you know? Mm-hmm. The girl or guy in front of me at the grocery store also has to get home to their family. You know, they're not in my way. We're all in each other's okay. world. You know, I'm not the center of the universe. So I think it's, I think it's reframing how you think about things, reading things that inspire you and surrounding yourself with people that you want to be like. Yeah, I'd have to very much agree with that. And then fast forward into your life now. I mean, now, well, I want to talk to you about your show on, um, on Food Network too, what was that like? What was it like being a Food Network star and oh my God. on their network and then the Food Channel? And I mean, you've had a variety of cooking shows on. on. Greatest experience of my life. The next Food Network star, all the talent, brilliant. The, the whole production company, everything about it was brilliant. And it was so cool too, because it was like under pressure. Can you, that's when, like, it's really interesting, right? This is what I say. Like I spent years making notes. I had little diaries before the days of, you know, smartphones making notes about flavors and foods and combinations and ingredients. And all of a sudden you realize you've built up this tasting database in your brain (laughs) where I can just go pomegranate, rosemary, rock and roll, you know? And all of a sudden you have a chance to test that, you know, and you put it out there, but at the same time, you're supposed to smile and talk while you're doing it all, (laughs) you know? And then getting my show on Cooking Channel was amazing. Oh, I know you traveled too, didn't you? With one of Yeah, traveled all of the country media. And again, like always, food to me, like when people say, my wife's like, why do we have to go out to dinner again or whatever, let's just stay home. I go. Because that table, what that really is, is the epicenter of connection. When you're at a restaurant, it's the food's important. I'm a chef. I love food. But it's this connection. We're here. We're talking, you know, right? Like our greatest moment shooting, we're like, at the end of the day, cocktail, you're connecting, right? It's everything gets, you know, peaceful in that moment. So so to me, it was like, it was just so amazing to travel around the country, meet these amazing chefs and see why they were so determined to make the perfect fried chicken. And it always was my mom, my grandma the one I love, you know, food to me is really just a vehicle for connection and people and cultures and languages. And it's unbelievable. I know it's just, it's, I love hearing you talk about it. And, um, all of this, all of the success you've had, you have a cookbook out too. Yeah. 
Yeah, Jeff Rashad's Global Kitchen, Cooking Without Borders. That's part of my uh, culinary ADD is I can't do any one thing. I'm like, I'm like, all right, I'm going to do a cookbook with all the countries in the world, you know. So it's it's like 10 chapters, 10 different countries. It's like drag your tongue across the globe. I love it. And you can get it on Amazon? Yeah, yeah, it's on Amazon or wherever you Okay, are. so talking about ADD and doing a million things, you are also like, how the heck did real estate come into this? And you are one of the top uh, real estate agents. You've been doing this for years, kind of on the side. And you probably, because you love it, because I know you wouldn't do anything you were passionate about. Yep. And what's that like? Real estate is amazing because, again, you know, it's funny. We we were lucky enough to be part of building up this big, big restaurant company, and we had a moment to be able to just back away and let it do its thing and go off and start something new. So we moved to L.A. because we wanted more house to raise our kids. And I said, well, hmm, I love being of service. I like the idea of being, you know, my own best customer buying real estate, and I believed in real estate as a long-term thing. And I love being of service, and I can't sit still. So I'm like, perfect, real estate. I can run around the city in circles, meeting different people, seeing different houses. And I love being a service. I love to see people light up, just like the meal, right? You put that burger out and they bite into it. It's the same thing. They get the keys to that house. And it's like, this is your dream machine. Your house is where you make your dreams come true. You know, and the people in it. You know, I would say my wife, my partner, when you get home at night, they better be shoveling coal in your soul. This is the place to recharge, you know? So I love that. And we just... You know, again, timing does matter. We got lucky and that we started in 2001. The market was taking off. My wife got her license right after me. We joined forces. I don't know how we're this happy together after working and being married for 25 years, but we do. But we you do, do it. great together, though. And, yeah, and, and it's and, fun. Yeah, and you still probably meet so many people, and it's just, it's endless. Especially in Hollywood and in, in Los Angeles, some of the houses I'm sure that you have sold. And I know some of the houses that you've sold. It's incredible. But one thing I love about you and your wife, you're a team, but you're also not, and you really are not about the money because you have it. You don't really, you're about, I mean, so here, okay, so Jeffrey and I were on set. <laughs> we're shooting this massively huge infomercial, which we were very excited about. But, yes. but he's, you are on the phone in between takes because you're passionately involved with your clients. Yeah. And that's what I loved. I, I overheard some of your, your conversation. You. You're like, okay, you're basically walking your clients either on the cliff or off the cliff, you know? You're exactly right. But you really care, and so does your wife, and I don't see a lot of people in this business that put the heart and soul into it Thank that, you. that you do. And Thanks I think, for noticing. And I did, and I think a lot of it comes from where you've come from and everything you've been through. And so if there's one last thing that I wanted, I would love to ask is, um, what would you say was that key thing that got you through that and has made you who you are today, you know, happy, successful. There's person. so many things, but I think really the number one thing is, is just being in the journey. Don't ever think about the end result of anything. Right. I always say, if you, you knew that whatever you did, you would fail, do that because that's what you really want to do. Don't do it because you know, you'll succeed or you think the fruit at the end will be good. Do what gets you excited to jump out of bed. And then whatever happens, happens. My restaurant, my last restaurant was a total failure. Greatest memories ever because I loved the journey. It was the joy of the journey. It didn't have to be successful to say, I'm glad I did it. The journey was great. So be in the moment, be in the journey. If you love what you do every day, the day I die, all I have to do is say, thank you. No should have, no could have, no would have, just I did it and I loved it. And I know for a fact, it did not fail because of the food. Because yeah. the food, I know people that know your restaurant. Well, thank you. And they have said that your food was spectacular. Thank you. It was thank timing. You. There's oh, other, yeah, yeah you know, it's business is business, but it was not the food. Yeah, thank you. So, but anyways, I just, I want to thank you so much for coming You're on awesome the show. You're awesome Yes, thank you, thank you. And I hope you guys enjoyed this. And if you want to binge watch Life Masters, which I'm hoping you do, make sure that you go to iTunes or you can also, well, you can binge listen, listen on iTunes, um, Life Masters TV, or you can go to EverTalk TV and binge watch us on Apple TV. How cool is that? We're on Apple TV. So all of you out there that have it, check out Life Masters on EverTalk. The logo is right behind Jeffrey's head, right there. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. You have just listened to another inspiring episode of Life Masters with Tanya Memi. To access the show notes for this episode or to listen to more shows, simply visit www.tanyamemi.com. Master your own life and be inspired to help others to succeed. Join us again next time here on Life Masters.